and there's nothing in the middle and the structures all along the outside and every little piece and fragment is resting on every other little piece which is exactly how language works all symbols are the only way we can define a symbol is to use other symbols and so we enter into the world of what's called diction and we make these books called diction aries and aries is short for the aryan race which means the nobles which is the same name meaning as alice in alice in wonderland her name also means noble when we think of nobles we think of you know some someone who who expresses courtesy and honor we also think of the idea of titles of nobility okay and the titles of nobility just simply exist within language there, there's no way they can really be abolished you know because if we're going to use a title to express to represent something if we're going to call this a cup we're going to call it a red cup and therefore we have to enter have to enter into the system of titles Okay, now, with, with these symbols that are used, we associate a meaning with them by using other symbols. And over time, we establish a collective idea of what, how a symbol is used. Okay, but um, there's the agreements that are made to establish how a certain system is used. We call those states. And sometimes some states have a different way it interprets symbols as other states because the symbols are really neutral. They're not good or bad. They're whatever we make it. And the way we fixate a symbol so that we can use it and communicate with the proper property is we, we use what's called sentences or, or judgments, okay? And judgment is just simply a statement. Again, we've got the word state involved there. So when we make a statement, we're like solidifying. Think about how many thoughts go in through your mind every day. And each one of those thoughts, you're considering some type of idea, some type of fiction idea to adopt into your reality or to maybe consider for a while and reject it, maybe not adopt it or adopt it later. And so really in doing this, when we consider all these ideas and then we, we begin making judgments and those judgments are like building the neural network in your brain so that when the firing uh, uh, continues, that that firing is, is, is operating in a certain pattern and that pattern is going to display a specific result which is gonna have maybe a thought and an emotion and an ex a resulting experience, okay? So if statements are the way that we establish reality, what's the way that we break it apart so we can travel to another, another place? If statements are the way we solidify and build, how, what if we wanna make an adjustment? We ask questions, questions. right? Questions are kind of that opposite, they're the inverse of making statements or judgments. I wanna go into the word judgment real quick. And the, and the influence of Jupiter, because all of our law is backed by myth. And there's a couple different tools of judgment. And first thing I want you to think of, who rules Jupiter in mythology? It's Zeus, right, in Greek mythology, and it's Jupiter in, in Roman mythology, okay? And Jupiter usually has a symbol of the thunderbolt, right? Which is the charge. Anybody ever heard you've been charged in a, in a court of law? So what, you know, if you have a charge, that means you have some type of energy, some type of will, and that there, someone's trying to communicate with you that you've got to pass that thing along, you've got to transmute it or do something with it, and then convey it to somebody. Perhaps you owe a charge to. And we also use that term in charging our account and stuff of that nature. And the whole commercial system, the way it exists, even though a lot of it's on paper or on computer, it's just simply dealing with the passing of energy from one position to another, and it's completely bound by the laws of nature. There's nothing going on in a bank or a government right now that is contradicting the laws of nature. And so therefore we can use natural law and recognize the harmony that is that is that harmony is bound by natural law. And so therefore, if we just observe how the laws of light work or the laws of reflection work or the laws of physics and realize that those perfect harmonic laws are existing in government right now, well, then maybe we it'll tune our perspective to realize that government, finance, and law are existing art forms that are just as beautiful right at this moment as all the paintings are and all the artwork and all the music that exists right now. Do we have an abundance of great music right now that exists in the world? Yeah. Right? Okay, so that's a perspective of the one fi of the one unity of, 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 all, of all things, right? And then we have great paintings, right? There's like amazing artworks. Look at Burning Man and all these different structures. It's so abundant right now. Well, this the art of exchange and commerce 
and, and the art of law is also extremely abundant right now. All we got to do is have eyes to see it. Now, some of us, we like to blame the laws that exist or the contracts that we've gotten into for the limits that we have. Like we can't maybe, we don't think that we can maybe use certain controlled substances or that to drive a vehicle that you need a driver's license or something like that. But really, laws, let's look at an example of another, another uh, character or another subject, I guess you can say. We'll use the subject of music that there's laws that exist within music, and those laws are like the law of harmonics, right, and wavelengths, and that there's such a thing as a major or minor scale, and there's different keys and notes. And these laws right here, if a musician was to come up to you and say, well, I'm like, I really wish to create all this amazing music, but the laws suck, the laws don't work. And so because the laws of music don't work, because there's such a thing as a major and minor scale, and that's what everybody uses to play, or a pentatonic scale, that I'm limited in my ability to make music. Well, it's true, it's more of a, it's a guide that exists, but to blame that musical scales and wavelengths exist for your inability to make music is as silly as blaming the laws for the reason why you can't perform. You can't perform certain actions that you feel that you're entitled to perform. Okay, continuing with judgment, there's a couple characters out there that also are sim uh, symbols of judgment. Anybody know which uh, day of the week is ruled by Jupiter? Thursday. Thursday, right? Thor's day, right? So Thor is also a symbol for Jupiter. That's why Thor has the hammer of judgment, J-U, Jupiter, judgment. A couple other terms that go along with judgment are <coughs> justice, jury, Judah, Judaeus, and conjure, which is like a magical, uh, bringing a magical element into it. And so something else that is a really famous um, art piece that presents the idea of judgment and establishing boundaries through judgment is Pink Floyd's The Wall. And The Wall, we're talking about this giant structure, this giant block, of, or it's really a giant interface that distinguishes one side from the other, okay? That, 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 and what's another symbol that's being used is the hammer, okay? So we got Zeus's lightning bolt, we've got Thor's hammer, we have the judge's, the judge's gavel. What's that? What's Thor? You haven't seen the movie Thor? He's a mythical, he's a mythical god. Um, so, uh, but more, more commonly, more commonly, the, the symbol of judgment is the pen, which also the name pen, like is used in Pennsylvania, means head. Okay, and the head is kind of where uh, your court is you know, inside your body, because we have the crown, right, that exists out here. There's this thing we call the crown, you know, but there's also the crown that's in here, right? So where's, so who's, so every day when we're interpreting all these thoughts and ideas, we're really just holding court, you know, and we're, we're working to establish our reality. And a lot of people that we communicate with, they give us, they come to our court and they petition us to adopt certain laws and beliefs. And some laws and beliefs, we say, well, that's not going to be established. We don't have an agreement and they get thrown out. Others get established. You might want to ask yourself, how, what kind of evidence is your court admitting to consider when it adopts beliefs? Do you admit hearsay into your court or do you just admit for people who have first-hand knowledge? For instance, how many people have first-hand knowledge that there's such a thing as chemtrails in the sky and that they are unhealthy for us? How many people here has, has first-hand knowledge of that? first-hand knowledge, by first-hand experience. It's an interesting thing when you're fed propositions, because if you just adopt any propositions and you're adopting hearsay into your court, then that's what, what's, what you're going to experience. You're going to experience something that's very loosely based, you know, and you're just going to kind of take anything in that comes. But if you're, you know, if you kind of, you know, stand back and say, well, hold on, there's there's a, there's some things that I will consider to adopt. I'm not just going to listen to what anybody says and take it for truth and adopt it in my belief system. I'm actually going to have a, a couple different rules that they got to kind of pass through my customs. And if I can rationalize it maybe, and I think that it's going to serve me, then maybe I'll consider adopting it into my belief system. But maybe... Maybe the idea of poisoning the well, like we, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of YouTubes about us poisoning the well, or that the well is poisoned. 
a lot of times it's the it's the conviction of the observer that poisons their own well you know hmm. right. uh, what's been on my mind a lot recently is like having a belief system in general and if that's in a constructive way to like reality mm-hmm. I mean it kind of locks you in right right um, there are certain things like my own empirical evidence that I'm you know do you think a belief system is essential to to creating an experience? Not really. Okay. So, like, <laughs> sometimes in our experience, that we have thoughts that come into our mind, right? And to have those thoughts and images, we're entering into the world of contra uh, light really, which has contrast. So in contrast, you're bouncing one thing off of something else. And in doing so, to, you have to first say, like what I just said was a statement, and you just said, right. So you just, we just both collectively established a belief that that was so. So I think the idea is that belief is a tool. You can use it, you can abuse it. Sometimes we establish beliefs, and we think that that's just the way things are. And we walk around in a victim state, kind of thinking that that's, we can't change it. Okay? And, and what it really was was just a series of a, a pattern that we were proposed every day, and every day we said, judgment for this side. This is, I believe this to be true. I believe this, this, this thing, this element of nature damages me right here based on the evidence that was proposed or based on a uh, YouTube I heard or someone said something to me or whatever. And, you know, so it's like really we just want to attune and see how we can use the tool and recognize that it's a tool just like the asking questions is a tool. If we just went around asking questions all the time. We would kind of lift up, be, you know, be the child. The child's in that constant state of discovery. Even when you're entering into a new relationship, it's all very exciting because there's so much discovery. But sometimes when we get into relationships, things start getting old. They start getting dry. They start getting boring. We start fighting. Why? Because slowly throughout time, we establish beliefs, collective beliefs with one another. And if that person starts acting in a manner that conflicts with that belief, what did they just do? They just breached your contract. And then there's dishonor. And then when there's dishonor, you, so you're saying someone's in debt to you. And they have to pay you in some way. Sometimes, you know, you note them on it and then maybe they pay you with an explanation or some type of testimony or some type of evidence or something like that. And so you can see how this kind of is, the commercial world kind of starts establishing by our judgments. So there's a lot of time, there's this idea that either we have no money or that the money system isn't working because, and we have this idea of a deficit that exists. A deficit simply means I recognize that what's going on in the world right now is that I am giving more than I am receiving. Therefore, I am at a loss. If I recognize the opposite, if I recognize that I was receiving more than I was giving, I would be at what? Positive. A surplus, right? But both of these ideas, am I, in the, am I in the state of mind of scarcity or abundance? When I have the fear of loss, am I in scarcity or abundance? Scarcity. I'm in scarcity, right? A little fear-based because of maybe my lack of faith or lack of understanding. So, um, so if you want to make that transition from scarcity to abundance, you have to realize that no matter how much you give, you can't lose. And the great example of that is the properties of light. When we have giving that occurs, when a mother gives to a child, or when a cell divides, when a cell divides, we have this, this funny paradox that's created. We have division. When a cell divides from one into two, is the end result a half a cell and a half a cell? No. It's one whole cell and one whole cell. So there's this idea of reflection that's occurring. When things reflect, there's an infinite level of expansion. There's an infinite level of growth, right? From going from going from one divided yet multiplied into two, which can then divide, I guess, into four and so forth. So this idea of the laws of reflection and, and this and making things grow. You know, and also that when you're giving, you're not losing anything. You're simply reflecting the light that you have or the light that you're harnessing, the charge, you know, for that matter. And in reflecting, then you have you have growth and all you got to do is realize it. So a lot of time it's not that we're not receiving. We're giving too much and not receiving. It's we don't recognize what we're receiving. That's where the idea of like, hey, we got to remember to to inspire gratitude. 
And gratitude is when we recognize that we are receiving just as much as we are giving. And so there's no debt, okay, that we have. And there's actually in commerce, there's a self-checking system which asks you a question. Are you giving equal to what you're receiving? And that system, believe it or not, is called the internal revenue service. Internal revenue service just poses one question. Can you, are you, well, how do you recognize the way you're exchanging value with your world? Are you receiving more than you're giving? Are you, if you're receive, if you're giving more than you're receiving, we owe you a refund. If you're receiving more than you're giving, you owe tax. If you account for the way you exchange in your reality, and you make a record of it that you are giving equal to the amount of your, that you're receiving, you don't owe any tax. You actually become tax exempt. And all government entities are tax exempt because the way they account for things, they always make sure they give equal to the amount that they receive, yeah. which is different than, than in corporate accounting, you may just recognize that you're giving and not receiving. And so there's little tokens, there's little symbols that exist out there that remind you that you are receiving equal to the amount that you're giving, but they may be overlooked. And we're going to let that card game kind of unfold because that's what we're dealing with here. I just want to finish up on a couple things on Jupiter and that the pen is a symbol of judgment. Every time you sign your name to a piece of paper, when you make a sign, which is another uh, synonym for symbol, you are actually executing a judgment. And there's great power involved in that. It's a great asset because you can create reality, but there's a great liability because you're creating boundaries. And so just recognize that it's your choice and the boundaries that you are creating for yourself. And there's some beliefs you may have established that you may want to lift off from. We're constantly going through this idea of destruction and creating, reinventing ourselves in our reality. And that's kind of just a symbol of the breath. Contract, contracting and expanding back and forth. And that idea of contracting, we hear about a lot. We call it contract law in, in, in law and commerce. But that idea of expanding, there's a, a word for that that's kind of unfamiliar to all of us that it's a synonym. It's called monetization. That's that element of expanding that's the opposite of contraction. It's the inverse. And they both work together just like the breath does. Okay, just one line real quick. Is anybody know the sacred animal for Jupiter? Lion? It's the eagle. eagle. The eagle. And, and where is the eagle? Where can we find? Who's using the mascot of the eagle right now? Us, right? We are. Us. As a, as a collective. Us. Our collective. Okay, as a sky god, Jupiter was a divine witness to oaths, the sacred trust on which justice and good government defend. Just going to give you guys some synonyms for judgment real quick is decision when you make a decision that's question a judgment oh go ahead i just had a question about uh, good government is that is that a reality i mean is it you know well we've, we've, like, we've asked the question is that a reality so you know me and you we can hold court right now and we could form an agreement whether that's true or, or a fact or, or not a fact you know but really it's it's like everything else is in the world it's a paradox Paradox means that there's two extreme opposites existing simultaneously. So is the government perfect? Yes. Is the government not perfect? Yes. Is the government broken? Yes. Is the government fixed? Yes. Each one is a binary code and duality. But which one you choose to start adopting into your daily practice, that's what you're going to experience, let's say. Does that cover that? Cool. Sick. Okay, so... We're going over the ideas of judgment, and another term is for judgment, I would say, is, is um, to interpret. And in fact, there's three branches of government that we have in us, okay? And in us, these three branches of government in us are what we call judicial, legislative, and executive. Anybody know what the judicial does? It interprets. So the, the part of your body that interprets... That is Jupiter. That is the judicial part of your body. That is the eagle, which is where? At the top of the caduceus, right? Or the wings are at the top of the caduceus, which is where? Where the crown chakra is, where you hold court. Okay, so the judicial branch interprets the law. Anybody know what the legislative branch does? Again, we're talking about us, what's existing in us. Is it what? Write the law. Write the law. Really close. It makes, makes the, the law. law. 
or creates the law. So you have the judgment, and then the next step that goes through is creation, manifestation of the law. Okay, or I'll say I'll say creates the law or makes the law. It's also a synonym for make is to pay the law. Okay, to give the law. And then we have. So what do you guys think the the ju the if the judicial part of our body is like our, we'll say it's our crown chakra, it's where we interpret or we make judgments. Where would we say that the making part of our law is? Any ideas? What, what, what's, go ahead. Your hands? Wow, I like that. Anybody else? Your throat? That's really good because through vibration, everything's created. Yeah. So just explore that idea, like I'm saying, I'm going back and forth. It's outside here. We've seen it outside here forever, but we haven't been seeing it inside here. So when we start to get inside here, there's going to be a there's going to be a balancing that takes place where we become government again. We realize that we're governing. Okay. So there's the making of the law, which we could say it's with the hands, it's with the throat. By the way, you guys remember in that uh, story, the Leviathan verses in the Bible. Do you remember that Leviathan had a strong neck? What's the importance behind the neck? It's got the throat chakra, right? And the throat chakra ties in the heart with the mind. It's that common place where the mind and the heart, which have different ways that they operate, can communicate with one another, right? So Leviathan has a strong neck. Okay, and then we have the executive branch of government. We like to say execute. Someone takes their head off. We say off with their head or whatever. We say they've been executed. But also we have an executive branch of government that executes the law, which means to take it into completion. So what part of you, what part of the body of us, makes takes out our creation into completion? What do you guys think? Hands? What did I hear? Stomach. Stomach? Interesting. Heart? Yeah, yeah. I mean, all these sound good. You know, I would say the senses, you know, the senses and the emotions. When you for, when you come to the conclusion that you're having an experience, that's when you know that manifestation has been made from start to finish. So you have an experience. The way you have an experience is you use your senses for the most part and your emotions. You know, you know the chemicals that are released in the endocrine system and other parts of your body. Okay, another... Um, synonym for judgment is law and belief and uh, civil power. I just want to go over that word civil real quick, which simply just means of public and of courtesy. So if you ever make an art piece and you publish it, it becomes civil. And if we all form a collective agreement that we're all going to agree not to walk on a certain path because there's snakes on it or we want to protect nature or whatever it is, then that, that law right there, that what we just did was we formed a civil power. Okay, and uh, civil also is related to courtesy, which has the word court in it. Okay, so we're talking about um, the benefits of judgments. There's there's benefits, which there's assets of judgments, and there's liabilities. I think we covered that. Where when you establish a judgment, you're building a bridge to to create an experience, and then when you ask questions, you are can remove bridges, and you can kind of break down your reality so that you can start over again. It's kind of like putty. There's a term in Black's Law Dictionary, which is a commonly accepted law dictionary, that the word is to become. And to become actually means, and since we've been on the subject of states and states of consciousness, that to become means to move from one state to another. Okay? And we do have that ability to become, and it's a mode of travel. Okay, to, act, to access one state of our consciousness and another state of our consciousness. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a definition here. And the definition is the word belief. And we're going to distinguish the word belief from knowledge. Okay, so maybe we can use this as a tool. I'm not say to, saying to take it as true. We're saying maybe we can use this, this word here as a tool once we express it to help regulate our court. A belief is a conviction of the truth of a proposition existing subjectively in the mind and induced by argument, persuasion, or proof addressed to the judgment. A conclusion arrived at from external sources after weighing the probability. Conviction of the mind 
arising not from actual perception or knowledge, but by way of inference. Anybody know what an inference is? To induce, to induct, like induction, logic. Induction. Like and what is induction? It's like to add to. To add. It's perfect. Because basically inference means a fact that is drawn off another fact. Okay, so if you come up with, you see like evidence somewhere, maybe you're wondering where someone went and you find a clue, you may take that piece and draw other facts off of it. Okay, those are called inferences. By the way, we're still on the subject of what a belief is, which remember comes from external sources. Beliefs are arrived at from external uh, sources. Okay, so conviction of the mind arising not from actual perception or knowledge, but by way of inference or from evidence received or information derived from others. A conviction of the truth of a given proposition or an alleged fact resting upon grounds insufficient to constitute positive knowledge. Okay, so there's a lot of things that exist out there in our daily experience that we may look at and say, question and say, is this my knowledge or is this my belief? Knowledge is an assurance of a fact or proposition founded on perception by the senses or intuition, while belief is an assurance gained by evidence and from other persons. Okay, so anything you hear from somebody else, we could say that that is a belief, a belief right? But here's where, here's where freedom comes into play. The freedom comes into play is that how did we experience that other person? Through our senses, Through our senses which is knowledge. Okay, so we're giving you guys the freedom to move, to be liquid, to go back and forth, and choose whichever way you want. Okay, there's a saying in Matthew 7, if you guys aren't aware, the book of Matthew, the name Matthew means gift of God, and uh, there's, a, a, there's a saying that goes, judge not that ye be not judged. Anybody feel like they've been, they've been judged, or that they feel like maybe when they go to court they fear the judgment, that maybe the judgment of the judge doesn't agree with how they think things should be or anything like that, okay? But really, where does, you know, where does the judgment truly come from? It comes from the judgment of, of you first, and then you're the one who grants the power, and they just reflect it back. It's a perfect law of reflection. And there's an example that I have here in Alice in Wonderland. And, uh, yeah, anybody read Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass? Or actually read the book? Yeah. Yeah, good. And Alice, if you remember when she's running, when she what's after court, she's running away. Who are, by the way, who are the soldiers of the court? Cards. Yeah, pretty cool. Did the cards are the soldiers of the court? Do you have a question? Okay. That the cards are the soldiers of the court, and in commerce, all we're doing is playing a card game. It's a global card game. Where all we're simply doing is putting symbols on pieces of paper and passing them around and saying that they have value. And you can create your own pieces of paper. You know, I was talking to an artist friend of mine, and he says, he goes, Zach, after talking to you, I realize I'm doing the exact same thing you're doing. I'm making these art pieces. I'm taking a blank piece of paper, a piece of garbage I pick up on the side of the road, and I paint it, and I convince people to adopt the belief that this has the value that I say it does. And then they... I give it to them and then they give me something of equal value in return that I think is of equal value. So it's interesting that we're playing a card game right here and most people, you know, you know, there's, I'm from Las Vegas and so there's a lot of card playing going on in Vegas. And um, if you imagine playing the game of poker and only recognizing that the royal cards are anything of value, that, that it, you can only get like, four, like you get four kings, you're good, but if you had, if you had a straight, Let's say a, 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 like a straight or a straight flush, right? That went from like two, like the two and up. You wouldn't recognize there's anything of value, so you would discard, okay? Or you would try to get you know your royals in there, maybe a, maybe a pair of jacks or whatever. How good of a poker player do you think you'd be? Very limited, based because what your limited knowledge of how the game works, right? What about musicians? The more they practice their scales and their theory, the more their ability they they attune their ability to play music. Well, it's the same thing in law. There's not one law that exists out there that's stopping you from doing anything you feel you're entitled to do. All the law does is establish a mode or a, a guideline for how you go about doing it, not if you can do it. And the reason why is because in the law, there's these things called loopholes. 
I'm going to give a perfect example for what a loophole is. It's the torus. The shape of the torus in the middle, that holy thing, is the loophole. Loophole is not a mistake. It's by design. It's a symbol of perfected geometry that there are loopholes. It's not a mistake. Okay, so I'm giving you some quotes from Alice in Wonderland here. No, no, said the queen. Sentence first. Verdict afterwards. Stuff and nonsense, said Alice uh, loudly. The idea of having the sentence first. Hold your tongue, said the queen, turning purple. Remember the crown. I won't, said Alice. Off with her head, the queen shouted at the top of her voice. Nobody moved. Who cares for you? For you, said Alice. She had grown to her full size by this time. You're nothing but a pack of cards. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to establish is the only way the judgment, a judgment can be had against you in a court of law is if the plaintiff and the defendant both make judgments first. All courts are tribunals, okay? There's three parties that are involved. The judge is, yes, impartial. They're resting in the middle. They're the Holy Ghost and the Holy Trinity. The plaintiff, we can say if they're dishing it out, they're the father. And we can say that the son is the defendant. But it's not until the defendant makes a statement, makes testimony, that the judge can then place a judgment upon that testimony in accordance with the law. What happens if you never make a statement? Or what happens if you realize the power of a single statement? You may want to spend some time becoming clear and negotiating just how you arrive at giving that statement, okay? So what happens, there's a, a, probably one thing that comes up in a lot of our minds, well, that's not true, I went to court and I didn't show up, I didn't say anything, I didn't make any statements, and they still ruled against me, and I still got my property taken, or I still, you know, still something happened to me, I got a warrant for my arrest. Well, if you're not there to make a statement, you're doing this thing called acquiesce, which is carefully outlined in its, there's a, there's, it's in the Constitution of the United States that there's this idea of acquiescence that if you don't respond, the other party can just treat it as if you said yes to whatever you said, whatever you communicated. And so if you don't respond, if you, for instance, get pulled over and you're sitting there in a car and the cop says get out of the car and you don't respond, what are you really saying to the cop? You're saying yes, but then you're not getting out of the car. So what's happening? All of a sudden there's a conflict. So what's going to happen with the vibration? It's going to go get dense, right? It's going to move down and get dense and get really rigid and, and, and thick, full of matter. And so what happens now? Conflict happens. All of a sudden you have an arm on, you get pulled out of the car, and your first thing is you want to go into a victim state saying that the government's out of control, which you're right because it's your government that's out of control inside your mind, and that, that the government just overpowered you. Your own government overpowered you. So it's good to communicate. It's good to communicate in a in a common tongue. Okay, so I, I got this little piece about Alice in Wonderland on my website. It's actually mine and my brother's. It's called Order of Merchants. And you guys can check it out if you want. It's under the archives, under myths and fairy tales. And that's the thing. The art of law has got is just packed with myth and color. That's why we call it colorable law. And if you could recognize the color in between the black and white, you will then be you will then free yourself of that prejudice, again, J-U, the Jupiter, that prejudice that we all that we all sometimes often share to feel like we're not in control. And so we blame somebody else for it. And we call that government. We call that finance, the financial system. We say it's from somebody else's decision. Oops. Okay, I got some funny overlaps of music and commerce. And also, the serpent's going to come back into that, too. Uh, anybody here know to read sheet music? Two? Just two people? Three? Four? Five? Okay. What's that thing called with the five lines that go across? Staff. Staff. And then staff, is that crooked or straight? Straight. Okay. And then what about... Um, when the notes all go in a specific order, we call the major, minor, pentatonic, what do we Scale. call those? Scales. Scale. What else has scales? What type of animal that goes like this has scales? Snake. So there's this symbol in music that has the staff and the serpent. 
Okay, and yes, we have the Caduceus with two snakes, but there's also a serpent with one snake and one staff. Anybody know what that's called? No. It's called the Rod of Asclepius. It was a, it was, it was, it's a symbol of healing, okay? By the way, when you have one staff coming straight up, and then you have a curve through it like this, what symbol am I creating? What is it? The dollar sign. The dollar sign is a symbol of the serpent and the staff. So we have the scales which are curved or crooked. By the way, anybody know what the name Obama means? Crooked. Anybody know it? Uh, oh, what does it know? Because Barack means crooked and Obama means blessing or one or the other. His name means crooked blessing. Okay, but by the way, when you see something that's crooked, you call it a crook. Right? But who's that who holds the crook? The Pharaoh. The Pharaoh, right? The Taurus. The Pharaoh that's fair and just. Okay, so, so there's this idea in music that we have something straight, which is unmoving. And that, that which is straight, we say, is right. And we say that which is crooked, we say it's left. We also when we say when it's straight, we say, be straight with me, be, be good, right? And then we have that which is crooked, which is, what's the opposite? It's evil, right? So you have this idea of a balance of good and evil in the symbol of the dollar and in the musical scale, okay? Now also in music, we play these little pieces of music and each one individually is called called notes right but we have these pieces of paper in our document that we're also playing which are also called notice notes federal reserve notes and note is just simply short for notice right when someone sends you a bill in the mail they're giving you notice when you get a summons in the mail you're getting you're getting a notice but where does the word notice come from it comes from gnosis g-n-o-s-i-s which means knowledge you're giving somebody knowledge you're allowing them to entertain an idea a proposition and if you agree to that proposition, you guys have formed a contract, an agreement. Okay, so also, notes are played with what kind of tool? Instrument. An instrument. We have these things called negotiable instruments, pieces of paper that are used in commerce to, to help finance trade or to help move trade, to help convey value. Okay, and there's one other thing that we do with these with these notes and with these instruments is after you've got a bunch of notes in your head or you're playing it on your on your guitar and you want to share it with everybody, what do you first do? Record. You record. You make a record. Well, it just so happens in, in commerce and in, in law, finance, we do the exact same thing. We make notes for a record with instruments. Okay? So, you see, it's you, commerce is, in law is even using the exact same words as music does to communicate how it operates. It operates with the exact same fundamental laws as music. And a full song, we have a collection of notes, and we could say all those notes are, are a little individual persons. They have their own little personality, but they've all banded together, right, individually to make one whole. What is it called when a bunch of different states come together to make one collective state? What's that called? Well, that's good. I like union. It's called federal. Federal is a union of states. Okay, I want to give another metaphor. I gave a metaphor earlier about um, how the laws of music are like the musical scales and the wavelengths and harmonic frequencies. There's laws of, of art as well, or coloring, right? There's laws of color that are that it, that are exi that exist. And one of them is that uh, um, yellow and red makes orange. So again, to make the statement that the law is stopping you from performing actions that you feel you're entitled to is equivalent to saying that you can't make good art because red and yellow make orange. Okay, there's a couple quotes I have here. Everybody seen Pirates of the Caribbean? It's a great, a great example of, of contract law. Um, because they're all constantly negotiating with one another. And there's this saying that was given by Captain Teague, which was played by, who was he played by? From Rolling Stones? He was supposed to be Jack Sparrow's dad. Mick Jagger? Mick Jagger, yeah. No, Keith Richards. Oh, Keith Richards, Keith Richards, Keith Richards. Keith Richards. there we go. Thank you. Okay, so 
Captain Teak said the code is the law. If you remember, they had the pirate court, and that one pirate kind of talked out, and he got shot immediately because he abandoned the collective. So he went to war with the collective. So he was shot. Captain Teague said the code is law, but we have another famous pirate, Captain Barbosa, which said since the first, the first uh, movie of, of Pirates of the Caribbean, he said the code is more what you call guidelines. And I want you to think about it just like that. When we have a mouse and a maze, that the actually governing aspect of the maze is is the guidelines, the walls of the maze, okay? And the mouse going through the maze, it's not being really stopped. It's just being guided from getting to what it wants. And like that cheese, is that is there's a way to get to that cheese for that mouse in the maze, or just a specific way of conduct it must perform to get to that cheese? It the, works the exact same way in law. Everything that you guys think that may be illegal, it's actually legal, okay? There is, you have the right to do anything. You just have to realize how you have the right to do anything. And that's, and that's conveyed through simply communicating with the part of you that is government to say, I hold a certain amount of interest in this. I'm willing to conform to the customs so I can interact at peace. And not only will you be able to realize that you have always had the right to do those things, perhaps since we will see use the example of using controlled substance, but now you will have full support of the community, and you will have military backing, you will have everything you want that you felt that you were entitled to, and you'll be 100% supported. And so now, so there's this, there's this other book I want to introduce. It's by Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and so, excuse my French, I guess. But, yeah, perfect. Yes. The social, the social contract. You read this? No. You heard about it? Yes. You have? Okay. I think it was written in the 1900s or 1800s or something like that. Early 1900s or 1800s. And there's some very interesting elements that go along with this book. And again, he is supporting government. He's supporting government where it's at currently. There's a little short piece I want to read real quick, and I want you guys to think about this. Remember that word civil means to be courtesy, to be like courteous in public, to respect the customs of your fellow man or, or the customs of the realm. So he says that we might, and by the way, when I say the word man, realize woman also has man in it, so it means man and woman, okay? We might also add that man acquires with civil society moral freedom, which alone makes man the master of himself. For to be governed by appetite alone is slavery. Mm. While obedience to a law one prescribes to oneself is freedom. So I'd like you guys to consider that, that when we are in the position of an individual, a lot of times, and we're not thinking about anybody else, just our own well-being, we're often in the position of, of, of animals in nature. We're in the position of fight or flight. By the way, territorial, the idea of territory and violence didn't come with man. Right? It came with nature. Right? The idea of being territorial and things like that. Fighting for your food. You know? Um, what's that? The strongest survive, survival of the fittest. Right? So, but if you're governed by your instinct, which animals are completely governed by their instinct, a lot of the time they can be governed by the, their appetite, what they feel that they need. If their body says food, they become governed by their food. They don't, animal, um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, or as far as I've witnessed, and again, I don't have knowledge or whatever, but I've never witnessed, and there's no evidence that supports that an animal undergoes, undergoes a fast out of choice, you know? Maybe that's been observed somewhere, someone can enlighten me, but usually if they're hungry, they'll eat, you know, and they have the food that they're looking to eat. So just think about that. To be governed by your appetite is enslavement. Okay, the appetite of the individual. But if we all came together and said, hey, we want to make a collective community, let's all make a collective agreement that we slowly build, that we'll publish so everybody can see it, that will form our social contract, then collectively as a whole, we will make our own law where everybody realizes that they're doing everything not for the good of themselves as an individual, but for the good of the whole. And in doing things for the good of the whole, they now will have freedom because they will become obedient to a law, yes. But it'll be, they will become obedient to a law that they prescribe to themselves. Got one other piece I'm gonna read. 
And if you guys just want to kind of chill out and listen for a second. I assume that men reach a point where the obstacles to their preservation in a state of nature prove greater than the strength that each man has to preserve himself in that state. Beyond this point, the primitive condition cannot endure. For then the human race will perish if it does not change its mode of existence. Since men cannot create new forces, but merely combine and control those which already exist, the only way in which they can preserve themselves is by uniting separate powers in a combination strong enough to overcome any resistance, uniting them so that their powers are directed by a single motive and act in concert. Such a sum of forces can be produced only by the union of separate men, but as each man's own strength and liberty are the chief instruments of his preservation, how can he merge his with others without putting himself in peril and neglecting the care he owes to himself. This is a big question here. A lot of times we feel when we've gotten into this social contract with the social security card, our birth certificate, and all that stuff, that we feel like we're not being taken care of as an individual because the collective doesn't agree with us as an individual. Okay? And by the way, we have the power to influence that, but we first got to know the system that we're using and how it works. How to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force. So again, if for as an individual, if you have some possessions, you're the only one that can protect your possessions. But as a collective, if you have possessions and the collective agrees, well now you have the protection of the collective. Okay, so here we go. How to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force of all and under which each individual, while uniting himself with the others, obeys no one but himself and remains as free as before. This is the fundamental problem to which the social contract holds the solution. The articles of this contract are so precisely determined by the nature of the act that the slightest modification must render them null and void. They are such that, though perhaps never formally stated, they are everywhere the same everywhere tacitly admitted and recognized. And if ever the social pact is violated, every man regains his original rights and recovering his natural freedom, loses the civil freedom for which he exchanged for it. Mm. So this can happen again. The civil freedom, the civil, the, more, the social contract is not something that we have to do a bunch of paperwork to get out of. It's a simple choice of how we communicate with, with language, okay? That we can interface back and forth into our civil rights and natural rights. That's, how, that's what he's saying. These articles of association, rightly understood, are, reducti are reducible to a single one, namely the total alienation by which as associate himself and all his rights to the whole community. Thus, in the first place, as every individual gives himself absolutely, the conditions are the same for all. And precisely because they are the same for all, it is no one's interest to make the conditions one worse for others, which means burdensome for others. Secondly, since the alienation is unconditional, the union is as perfect as it can be, and no individual associate has any longer any rights to claim. For if rights were left to individuals, in the absence of any higher authority to judge between them and the public, each individual belonging to his own judge in some cause would soon demand to be his own judge in all. And in this way, to state, the state of nature would be kept in being and the association inevitably become either tyrannical or void. Finally, since each man gives himself to all, he gives himself to no one. And since there is no associate over whom he does not gain the same rights as others gain over him, right there he's basically saying, all the powers we give to public officers, we gave equal, there's an equal inverse that came back to us. So if we've granted powers to public officers, we can take them away. And there's provisions in the system that allow those, those possibilities to exist right now. Each man recovers the equivalent of everything he loses, and in the bargain he acquires more power to preserve what he has. If then we eliminate from the social pact everything that is not essential to it, we find it comes down to this. Okay, and listen really carefully in this last part here. 
Each one of us puts into the community his person, which is your mask, your social security card, your birth certificate, your, your name, your symbol. So each one of us puts into the community his person and all his powers under the supreme direction of the general will. And as a body, we incorporate every member as an individual or as an indivisible part of the whole. Immediately, in place of the individual person of each contracting party, this act of association creates an artificial and corporate body composed of as many members as there are voters in the assembly. And by this same act, that body acquires its unity, its common ego, its life, and its will. The public person, thus formed by the union of all other persons, was once called the city, and is now known as the republic, or the body politic. In its passive role, it is called the state, it plays an active role. When it plays an active role, it is called the sovereign. And when it is compared to others of its own kind, it is a power. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of the people and call themselves individually citizens and that they share... Okay, this is big because this is the paradox right here. Most people just see one side. In that they share the sov in the sovereign power... I'm sorry, let me say this one more time. Those who are associated in it take collectively the name of a people and call themselves individually citizens and that they share in the sovereign power and subjects in it they put themselves under the laws of the state. However, these words are often confused, each being mistaken for another, but the essential thing is to know how to recognize them when they are used in their precise sense. Okay? So... It goes on to basically saying that there are some times that they were playing a paradoxal... The game, like life is a paradox, the game that we're playing is a paradox. We are both sovereign and subject simultaneously. When you're acting in the position of the subject, you are a citizen. But when you're acting in the position of the sovereign, you can operate representing the collective interest, which means that you're representing the interest of the whole, which we call that representing the interest of the people. And so in that position as a representative of the public interest, or when you come in and represent the interest of the people, you now hold the highest power because that power is the power of the collective as a whole. And we all, the system allows anybody to take over with regards to any specific issue. The system provides for, for a way that we can come in, talk to the people, get the people's approval, and now representing the people's approval, we have full governance over that specific subject matter that we're focusing on. And any public officer and their interest would be subject to that. And there's also ways that if the people have already granted their, in, their, their power, their charge to a public officer, that they can, anything they can grant, they can simply withdraw or take away and assign it to somebody else. Okay? So in this method I'm talking about, we're dealing with a lot of positions on a graph like we started talking about, that each position is like a piece on the circuit board. And if you follow the flow of energy, the flow of the charge, and you'll see how people get their energy, there's a way that you can discharge them and allow them not to be involved with that specific subject, no matter with, if it's within the state or without. And even within the state or within the United States, you have the power to govern. An individual has a power to represent the interest of the whole. And in doing so, there's nothing that can stop them. So that, that's the social contract right there, okay? It's a really good book, and it's not, it's not very long. And it, like I said, it's, um, it's written by... Jean-Jacques There we go. <laughs> Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Okay, I want to go into a little bit more of Alice in Wonderland real quick. Okay. Anybody remember uh, what the name Alice means? Noble. Noble, right. Okay. A noble is one who bears a title, so remember that. There's a symbol of something that's pure, okay, that we call... Um, anybody know who the messenger of God is? Uh, Gabriel. Gabriel? Archangel Gabriel. What's another messenger of God? An another... Gabriel? Um, yeah, I Michael? Metatron? Hermes. Hermes, there we go, messenger of God. And the messenger in that position is like the Holy Ghost, it's pure and white. 
It's like an example of, of a messenger would be the, a postman, right? Someone who doesn't have any interest in the letter besides to deliver it to the person from one person to another, right? So that position in commerce, you could see the carrier, you know, is the Holy Ghost position, which who else is a carrier in a relationship? Between a man and a woman, who's the carrier? Female, she's the Holy Ghost. Okay, in Alice in Wonderland, what is that white pure carrier? The white rabbit. And what's the white rabbit? What's his message? His message is the time. Time. Okay, now we're going to go into a little bit of color. When we go into court, we have, we, we're dealing, we're going in to check out what the accounting situation is. We're in there, we want to settle accounts so there's no debts. Okay, what's the symbol of accounting? It's called the T chart. So vital and so important that we may, there's a religion based on it. People worship, people worship the accounting and the settlement of their debts or their sins. Okay, and in the middle, in the T chart, when you're walking through the court, which symbolizes the T chart, you have the judge in the position of the white rabbit. So don't blame the judge for anything because they're just the messenger. Okay, and also a symbol of that T chart is called a table. And what did Jesus do with the table? He sat in the middle of it. He sat in the middle. He sat at the table. He met with his disciples, but then he ended up doing what to the table? What did he do? Flipped one. Oh, he turned the table. He turned the tables of the money changers. Right? Anybody know those public officers that are out there that their name actually means to turn? Attorneys. Okay, so that white position in the center, we got who's the messenger. And then we have on the we have on the left and right, we're dealing with the plaintiff and the defendant, which is the father and son. It depends who's talking. In fact, all parties at one time are going to play either the, the symbol of the, the position of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So just remember that you are the Father, you are the Son, you are the Holy Ghost. And you may be the Father when this person's the Son and this person's the Holy Ghost. And it switches every time something moves, the perspective their perspective changes and when you get really good in commerce you can see all the perspectives simultaneously and you can navigate through them okay so he's car- the white rabbit's carrying the message of the time right and we just learned that Leviathan is dead or dies when at the end of time the beast right it dies at the end of time and so Alice actually goes to a table doesn't she she meets the Mad Hatter and the March Hare, right? And they have T, which is a symbol for accounting, and they're also at the table. And then what happens? What concludes the court hearing of the tea party? What ends the court? What what ends the tea party? The time. The destruction of time, right? They smash the time. They say it was three days short, something like that. Three days short, and they throw it aside, and then that... Just close. We just close court. Okay. Also, something interesting when you get into the commerce game is we're constantly struggling with our identity. Who are we? Who are you? Who are you? What are you? Uh, well, you know, you're appearing today in court or whatever. Sometimes we realize that there's the social security card title is all uppercase, and we call that the straw man, which is linked with Wizard of Oz and all these great myths and stories and that we realize oh my god I'm not that that's something else and then we say well that's just the social security card name and that's a, that's a card right there that we're playing and so we're actually representing the name so we go into court we say I'm representing the name and the, the judge says so that's that that's Zachary Lloyd who are you and you say I uh, you say well I am this upper lowercase Zachary James Corzine who's in and the Republic of, of uh, represents the, the birth certificate in the in the state, and the Social Security card represents the federal person. And so I got these two persons. So I'm here appearing. I'm not this. I'm appearing as this, representing this. And then the judge says, "Okay, so Zachary James Corzine, United States citizen, is rep- is being represented by Zachary James Corzine, uh, um, state Republic citizen, and who's being represented by who?" And we say, "Who are you?" And this example of, of trying to unveil your masks when you find out there's nothing really behind it in the end. And there's a name, there's a title for that. But really the pure thing, it has no title, but we're going to put a title on it. It's called the Fount of Honor, okay? And that's the title of the Sovereign. That's when all the masks are taken away and the true power is really there. 
It's called the Fount of Honor. You can check that out on Wikipedia. So we have the caterpillar who's smoking, who uh, who challenges uh, Alice's identity. She challenges he challenges the title of Alice, and he says he says, "Who are you?" So that's just something else again that's pertinent in court. So I just wrote a little sentence here. Alice, the noble one, is summoned to court, which has a close affiliation with the heart and losing one's head. Right? The queen is the queen of hearts. But Alice, the, the, we fear, we call us chopping off your head, or we say, lose your head. If I lose my temper, you lose your head. But your head is simply your, what's, what's the part of a piece of paper that's the head? It's the title. So what they're saying is you lose your title, which means you lose your property. And oftentimes you're afraid to give up your property. You're afraid to give up your head because you feel like there's something up here to lose. Okay? Or there's something up here that maybe you don't have. Sometimes we're, we have a pro, we, we uh, get a bill in the mail that we don't feel we have the money to pay. So because we don't see that we have the money to pay, then we feel that there's this imbalance. We decide to maybe we can challenge that, the, that us owing somebody money is even justifiable. And we challenge the bill, we challenge the system, we challenge the idea of money, that it exists, that it's all bullshit, right? And we're challenging the fiction. But remember, the fiction is a game for children. So you have to have the mind of a child in order to play. There's a concept about losing your head that's similar that a famous guy talks about. His name's Timothy Leary. And he makes this statement, while, while you're using psychedelics, you have to go out of your head or go out of your mind, which is a sim synonym for, like, being crazy. Insanity. Insanity. Which is what? You're not being straight. You're being crooked. You're being evil. Okay, I hope I'm saying this right. Someone can correct me. There's a the royal court up here is called. You can do it. Sahasrara. There we are. <laughs> there we are. Which is a symbol of purple, which is a symbol of royalty. And you think about the color purple as two colors mixed together, blue and red, which are the colors of oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood, and the joinder of that is what we associate with royalty. Okay, so the Sahasrara chakra symbolizes detachment from illusion, an essential element to obtaining... You can think about court. What are we there in court for? We're there to decide what is real. Even though the court is completely fiction and make-believe, we're still there actually saying, let's all agree, let's just all agree for one second that it is this way. And, that, and then we can go ahead and play the game. Okay? So... It symbolizes detachment from illusion, an essential element in obtaining supra-mental <coughs> higher consciousness of the truth that one is all and all is one. Often referred, by the way, it makes perfect sense in court. What are we there to do? What's the objective of court? There's these people in court that appear. They're called parties. And the objective, just like it is in, just like it is in college, what is that? To resolve a contract, to have settlement, right? To have joinder. So that our minds meet the same because if we're in court, it's because there's some difference somewhere. And so you have your party, I have my party, but really we want to have our party yeah. and we want to join the parties, okay? And that's actually a rule of court. If the parties aren't joined, there can be no judgment. There can be no case. It's also referred to as the thousand-petaled lotus, right? This chakra. It is said to be the most subtle chakra in the system relating to pure consciousness. And it is from this chakra that all the other chakras emanate. Okay, when a yogi is able to raise his or her kundalini, which we're dealing with the serpent, energy of consciousness up to this point, up to the top where the wings are, I guess, symbol for Jupiter, the state of samadhi is experienced. Meditating on this point is said to bring about the siddhis, is it siddhis? Siddhis. Siddhis or occult powers of transforming into the divine and being able to do whatever one wishes. So being able to master of your court is going to help and assist you in manifesting your, your wishes. Okay, there's a, at the top in the court, we, we have this thousand petal lotus, which is a flower. It just so happens that in our coats of arms, which is a huge area in the Middle Ages of celebrating, um, you're celebrating the Holy Trinity and celebrating um, the, the uh, like patriotism or celebrating like 
the culture that is that each house has and the differences and the unions that they have with one another. There's this great symbol that's out there. We all familiar with it. It's called the Florida Leaf. It's like three, it's like a lily, right? It's a symbol of the Holy Trinity. What's so funny about the symbol of the lily and the reason why so many people choose to adopt it is that the lily, there's actually a girl, a name of a girl, and her name means lily. Anybody know what that is? Don't say it if you know. Anybody else know what it is? You know? What is it? That's right. Very good. Nice. It's Susan, but what's short for Susan? Sue. Sue. Right? Which happens what we call when we want to take somebody to court. We sue them. Call them into court. So what are we really doing? Well, first thing, court. We have courts out there that a court's a synonym for a garden. Right? Where things grow and they bloom. A.K.A. monetization. Okay? So what are we really doing when we're suing someone? We're passing somebody a flower and saying, come hang out in court with me. Again, the color that's behind what's going on. Once you see the color and you're like, I had no idea it was actually just as artistic. You know? And in, and if you weren't re recognizing it as being that artistic, maybe that's why you're in the current position you're in. But if you are recognizing it as being really artistic, maybe you're super interested in it right now and you're having a lot of fun. Okay, so the court, the royal court of Sahasrara is where judgments are made and laws are established. Okay, so the last thing I want to go over, I'm kind of over on time, but I started late. Okay, I kind of want to show this actually to everybody. I'm using the Vesica Pisces here to talk about accounting, okay, which I know seems like a boring subject, but we're going to use some sacred geometry here, okay, if you guys can see. Okay, so here's this Vesca Pisces here, and I just broke down commerce again into three moves. There's giving, and there's receiving, but then through the center here we have this gift of creation, okay? And I'm going to show you how most of us are accounting right now, and I'm not talking about necessarily what you're literally writing down on pieces of paper. I'm talking about how you're accounting in life, okay? Is your mo You're isolating this right side of the Vesica Pisces, okay? So here's what's going on is the exchange that we're seeing in commerce right now is that I want to go buy food at the grocery store. So I'm going to take some Federal Reserve notes from my credit card and I'm going to give, we're going to, I'm going to enter into the world of exchange or commerce. I'm going to give them Federal Reserve notes, which is the, my giving value. And what I receive is my groceries, which is my receiving value. The problem is when I eat my groceries, right? So what I did, I had an asset, which was these Federal Reserve notes. I had a liability. I was hungry. I traded in my asset, okay? And then I got a new asset in exchange, which was the food. But now I eat my food. What happened to my asset? It's gone, okay? So what do I have to do? I gotta go get more Federal Reserve notes. I'm gonna have to go perform labor somewhere to get more Federal Reserve notes, okay? And it's in that idea that we have right there, that exchange that I just spoke of, is how most of us are viewing the commercial world and that's why we feel it's not working. Because we are consuming our assets and therefore there's a loss that's involved. Now I'm gonna to propose to you, now this accounting that is, is existing with the double entry bookkeeping system, but there's a, a level of accounting that exists, a level of accountancy that exists where you're actually recognizing a more complete level of what's going on and that's called shared accounting or government accounting. And this is this level of accounting is the reason why governments are completely tax exempt. Okay. And that's this right here. Is that there is a giving which is our which is our payments, okay? But the receiving is not the food, it's not the goods or ser or services. The goods or services that come through is actually they're coming through the portal in the Vesca Pisces, they are the gift of creation. The thing that we are receiving is the receipt. But here's, the, here's where we go back to the rules of the card game. How many of us know how to convert a receipt into a Federal Reserve note? You can't go to the store and buy food with a receipt. So why is it of any value? What do we usually do with our receipts? We say, keep it, or we throw it away. We put it in a drawer, we know it's worth something, but we don't know how. If you learn how to use billing, uh, bank statements, or your bank contract, or your receipts, or your bills, if you learn how to use the bill and mimic what the president does with the bills to finance the country, you'll be able to finance your debt with your bills. Okay? So there's these pieces of paper that are cards in the card game that all you have to do is 
read the instructions on how to play the card game, and I'll give you a couple names for some of the instructions that will help you guys out that the people believe in. It's the people's law. So you know that when you're making those moves in the card game, you're acting with the force of the collective, just not, not with the force of the individual. Okay? So here's, here's the move. You're paying with Federal Reserve notes. You're receiving a receipt. And what's coming through the gift of creation is the goods and services. So there, if you ever heard of this myth that everything is free, everything in life is free, or that everything is prepaid, there's a prepaid account that exists. It is with the geometry of nature that is securing that. Now, the first question probably a lot of us are asking is, how the heck do I take a receipt and turn it into a Federal Reserve note? Wouldn't that be amazing? Would anybody think there was a money problem if we were able to turn our receipts in? If you were to take your receipts, take them somewhere, add them all up because they're all positive numbers, take them to some place and they were to give you Federal Reserve notes. Anybody think the system would be have a financial problem? You still do? Sure, because it would devalue the original currency. It would devalue the original currency. Okay. It's an interesting idea. The thing about government accounting is that what you're saying is if right now we're in a deficit. If we adopt this level of accounting, we would be at a surplus. And so therefore we would have the value of money would go down, right? You'd be spending thousands of dollars to buy a soda or whatever, okay? But actually in government accounting, they're not concerned with surplus. We're concerned with zero. We're concerned with leaving nothing at the end. In fact, when federal agencies report to the Treasury monthly through uh, <coughs> online, that if any of their moves do not end up at zero, then they are going to get a letter from the Treasury saying, you got to fix this, or you're not going to be approved for the budget for next year. Okay? So we're operating off of, we're, we're, not, we're, we're basically not teetering over from here to here to say deficit surplus. We're actually moving into right here. And so if we can actually operate that way where we're operating at zero, then there would be no change of value in the money. It would stay the same. So what would, that would be the unmoving, right? That part would move, would move from a teetering surplus deficit to an unmoving, which puts it into the position of what? The staff, right? And we'd be using all these notes, the receipts and bills, as the notes on our scale so that we can move along the staff. Big concepts, lots of color and myth, and there's lots of questions when the idea of the receipt comes about. And if you want to look at the definition that the White House actually puts out manuals, and they actually define the word receipt. And remember, I told you guys that we are entering into that interface where we're both subject and we're a subject as a citizen. We are a government if we represent the public interest simultaneously. We can do either one. So I want you to remember when you hear government, to think of this government, it's here. It's here. It's not, it's not just out here. It's in here as well. Receipts mean collections that result from the government's exercise of its sovereign power to tax or otherwise compel payment. They are compared to outlays in calculating a surplus or deficit. So all income received by the White House or by us is actually called receipts. Okay? And so I just want to do a little example of paper real quick. Okay? Because a lot of us, it's really hard for us to see that that paper is of any value, which is why we've been discarding it all the time. Okay? There's, we're going to say that paper that can be used, that everybody believes is worth something, that we can use just about anywhere, we're going to call that, we're going to say it has a lot of flow, it has high liquidity, it's really move, it moves really fast, okay, it's really easy to move. And in that category, we're going to put Federal Reserve notes, we'll put your credit card, we'll put your, your debit card, okay? And so we're all, we're all, we all know that those, that the people believe that that's valuable and that it's readily exchanged. But there's another level of paper that all of us know exists right here. And we're going to say this level has medium liquidity. And there's pieces of paper that are valuable, that everybody believes is valuable, that we have to go through an extra step to convert them into these higher liquid assets. And what I'm talking to right here is the title to a car, the title to a house, or perhaps stocks in a company, or perhaps debt securities or something like that you purchase from the securities exchange. You just have to simply go through one step, okay? You can go get a title loan. The 
Title loan will convert your title into Federal Reserve notes. You'll be able to take your Federal Reserve notes and go buy food. So it's a one-step conversion process. Therefore, it's medium liquidity. We had the high liquidity, where there's no step to conversion. You just give the money for the goods or service, and you're good. This one has an extra step to it. Well, there's another level that exists right here, which is low liquid assets that have to go through. An extra step is the medium link to get to medium liquid. And though that's where your bills, receipts, and bank statements are. And there's two main steps that you have to follow in order to get these low liquid assets, these receipts, bills, and bank statements into the medium level so that you can take it from the medium level and take it into Federal Reserve notes, okay? How many people would be pretty happy if they were able to convert their receipts into Federal Reserve notes? They are able to collect all their receipts. It'd be pretty cool, right? Okay, so here's, here's what it is. You have to ask yourself this, a simple question. What does a, what does a title to a car or a house have that makes it valuable for the, that the people believe that your receipt does not have? And I'll give two very, very simple reasons or things that need to be done to this piece of paper to get it under the medium asset category. One of them is you need, the people can't believe in something if they don't know about it. You have to publish. You have to organize your receipts through a system called a, a, a accounting system. And once you organize all receipts, you gotta publish how much, what's the value of all your receipts. And if you notice every title to a car or a house, they're published. And so therefore, if someone wants to purchase them, you publish the change of ownership from one position to another. Anybody sold a car, bought a car recently, or bought a house, or sold a house recently? You have to deal with the county recorder's office or the DMV to deal with publishing the piece of paper to make it valuable. The other thing that's, that's, that may seem like a liability to all, but if we take our new level of accounting, it's not that big of a deal, is it has to be taxable. When the IRS recognizes something as taxable, they're saying it's within their jurisdiction and they're saying that it's valuable. Once the IRS, once you get the IRS to believe that it's valuable by making it taxable, and you get the state to realize it's valuable by publishing it, you now have converted your low liquid asset to your high liquid asset, or to your medium liquid asset. Now you can take it and treat it as if it were a title to a car or a house, and you can get Federal Reserve notes with it. So, I'm talking about I'm talking about turning trash into treasure. I know. I'm just like I'm trying to like. Yeah. Right. Right. But there, there's a lot that goes along with it. I'm giving just giving a simple idea so that you guys can become curious about the idea, okay? Because obviously it's the entire world is enslaved to not recognizing this level of accounting that exists, okay? So yeah, you're using the IRS, but it's not through means of getting a refund through the IRS. You're simply using the IRS to get a transcript that shows that the IRS, on behalf of the United States, recognizes the value you're moving, okay? And at the same time that they recognize that, you have evidence that supports you're still holding all the assets, which is your receipts. And you went, you organized it all, and you made a public record of it, and you published it. And now you can show the bank, I'm holding this much value, okay? The people of the state agree, they believe in it, okay, because I published it, and that's what regulates the belief of the people is publications. And that the federal government also agrees because I made it taxable. It just so happens my in equals my out and vice versa, so I owe no tax. But the IRS still recognizes it nonetheless. So they're benefiting me, you know, and because the way I'm accounting, there's no tax liability, okay? And so now I could take that to a bank, and it's one of those things that a bank needs to convert your application into Federal Reserve notes. Anybody heard that the bank just takes your application and they pledge it to the Federal Reserve or they sell it and they get Federal Reserve notes and they, they pay you off of the money that you're giving them with the application? They just need to make sure the application is backed, that it's secured. And one of those pieces of security is going to be your credit score. The other one's going to be your IRS transcript. And the last one's going to be the public record showing that you have assets. And when you pledge your assets, just like you could pledge a house, you can get a secured loan. And so I know that's, that's a lot, it's a mouthful, but it's all really simple, you know, I promise. So do you have to operate at zero? The idea is to, is to have activity and to always come to, to, to settle, to settle and balance out at the end, at the, at the end of the day. To fully act, act as a position of a bank, you basically want to settle your accounts at the end of every day.
you know, and set them on a larger level at the end of every month. And what you're doing is you're building a vibration on how you're operating, and you will be able to achieve any type of funding that you're looking for for any type of projects. And again, when we're because uh, some of this stuff we've kind of moved into finance, but a lot of the time earlier we've been talking about government and law, but now we're in finance, okay, which is another element to working in commerce because commerce is just a tool for manifestation. It's just a way for us to say, hey, we want a building right there. We want this over here. We want to travel this group of people over this way and explore this sacred ruin over here. You know, we want to, we've want to. we got all the funding that we need for it or whatever. We can achieve all that stuff through using the tool of commerce. Okay. So I want to read this line one more time. Then I'm just going to give you guys links to information, and then I'm going to call it a day. I'll, I'll take questions, I guess, if I have time, if I don't get stopped. Okay, I'm just going to read this line one more time that I read earlier from from uh, the social contract book. We might also add that man acquires with the civil society moral freedom, which, al which alone makes man the master of himself. For to be governed by the appetite alone is slavery, while obedience to a law one prescribes to oneself is freedom. Okay, so here I'm gonna give you guys some links. One is the link to my website, which covers uh, has a lot of interesting uh, different things on it. It has webinars and seminars, has free audios. Uh, it has information that links you to laws because a lot of the information that I base off of, it's not based off of third party hearsay. It's simply based off of my own interpretation of the laws. My own interpretation of the laws, which are the people's belief. Okay, so the, the website is, is Order of Merchants. It's pretty simple to, if you can remember it. It's orderofmerchants.com. And if you want to get a hold of me, it's just orderofmerchants at gmail.com. And if you guys want to talk to me more about this, you can after we're all done here. Some other links I want to give you guys is that there are two really important government entities out there. And there's a lot of important ones, but there are two really important ones that are vital to recognize that they're, they're such amazing tools uh, that are out there. And if you just read with the, the laws that they abide by and what they do for us, they can really serve you. And a lot of you are familiar with these, the, the names of them already. One is the Secretary of State, okay? Secretary of State of California is one of the most powerful pieces in, on the government playing board. The other one is the County Recorder's Office, okay? So those two places, if you wanna, if you're interested in this type of stuff and you feel like that it's gonna serve you to look more into it, check out how those entities operate because those entities are existing systems outside of you as well as inside of you. Inside of you, there's the Secretary of State. Inside of you, there's the County Recorder's Office. It has its certain functions. The more you get to know it, the more you're get, you recognize what it does, and it's a power, it's a tool, you'll be able to use it to help manifest what you're looking for. There's three codes that I'm going to recommend for anybody. Well, the, and, and foundationally, actually, one thing on top of that is the dictionary is the most powerful book that's out there. Even, I would say, more powerful than the Bible, because without knowing the definition of what the words mean, it's really impossible to interpret the story, okay? So that you got to know how the person's using the words that, that wrote the story, okay? So the dictionary is that principal, principal thing. You can look at etymology, which is the study of word origin, which is at etymonline.com. It's the study of the origin of a word, where the word comes from. And you have Black's Law Dictionary. There's a series of Black's Laws. You can find the second one, I think, online for free. And there's three codes that I'm going to recommend right now. The first one I would recommend is the Federal Rules of Evidence. It's only 19 pages. Okay, This Federal Rules of Evidence will start getting you familiar with your court, even if you don't plan on doing the court thing and don't you want to stay away from the California Superior Court or whatever, you may want to work on this court. And so you may want to read about evidence and what constitutes evidence. You know, and what is admissible and not admissible. And maybe that's going to help you to discern what's really going on in the world and recognize that a lot of people are just presenting propositions to you. And you, when you adopt the belief, there's really, there's not much of a backing, you know, to, to it, you know, because there's no firsthand knowledge that's there. Okay, so Federal Rules of Evidence is one book that I'd say would really help you out. It's free. You can just put in F-R-E, believe it or not, on Google and it'll come up at Cornell Law for free or Federal Rules of Evidence. The next book that I would recommend, the next code, and again, these are these are these are codes that exist, is the UCC, which stands for Uniform Uniform Commercial Code, which is the uniform, a unified language of commerce. And 
uh, place a great place to start is to Article 3 of the Uniform Commercial Code because it's going to talk about negotiable instruments and it's going to introduce to you the card game of commerce and gameplay. It's going to talk about drawers, drawees, drawing, the idea of accepting a bill or order or a draft, just like the president adopts a bill, how he adopts a bill and makes it into money, you can adopt your bill and make it into money, okay? The UCC is pretty extensive. It's like 350 pages, so you got to take it a little bit out of time. But that book really will set you free in a lot of ways because it will – it's everything that's in that book you already know. You guys already know by nature. But it's a way to communicate it to where other people understand it in law. That's, that's the power that that book has. And that is also for free on the Cornell Law website. The last thing I would recommend is the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure which kind of introduces to us how court operates. And yes, it, it does introduce to us how federal court operates, but the state courts operate in a very similar way. And the federal rules of civil procedure is based off of international law that is made from the treaties at the world court at The Hague. And those international laws filter down to all the other nations, and all the other nations base their laws off of, or they reflect off of the international law, okay? So we were dealing with world law or international law or admiralty law when we're operating on this level. Okay, now I'll take questions if I have time. If anybody has any questions on all the nonsense, then. I'm gonna say thank you, first off. Yeah. Welcome. Hey, hey, hey. We have our flag, our white flag. <laughs> the T as well, it's a cross. Anybody any, have any questions? Anybody overwhelmed? That's usually the feeling I kind <laughs> of like. Gotta be, you better this be. This kind of leaves you in question, and you're like, I'm not sure if I really knew anything about anything. That was going on out there. Could, so, you, could you maybe t uh, go for it? Are these links you mentioned um, also on your website? The UC, the one that the UCC is for the Federal Rules of Evidence and Civil Procedure. We do mention them and talk about them on there. So okay. if you just remember those terms, okay. yeah, federal. It's just Federal Rules of Evidence and Federal Rules of Civil Procedure, FRCP and FRE. And if you even put in the abbreviations FRE or FRCP on Google. Cornell Law will give you the laws, okay? And those laws are codified in the United States Code as well, okay? Anybody else? Could you maybe touch on the Admiralty and the birth canal and the blood real quick so people get in depth with that? Okay. There's a huge, remember we were talking at the uh, about the crown earlier, make sure I stay on subject. Talking about the crown earlier, and the crown has to deal with royalty, right? And the royalty also has to deal with hierarchy. Royal, royal blood, you know? And the idea of hierarchy just simply means that there's succession that's going on, okay? That there's fathers and sons and children and members of the family. And in a way, when we're dealing with paperwork, if this piece of paper came off of this piece of paper, we can say that that's the child of that piece of paper. We already know there's companies called parent companies for other companies. So there's this idea of hierarchy that exists. And there's this also uh, idea of the, t of the word uh, prince, there's prince and princess, and prince is short for the word principal. Okay, so all I'm saying is that there's this area of commerce, in all commerce, that as soon as we get into the world of hierarchy, we can begin applying the idea of royalty and heirs and successors and, and um, you know, play pieces that have certain relationships, like maybe they're a sister or a brother to one another. So the idea of birth... Um, by the way, is like we're going to get into the admiralty because admiralty is basically like the, it's private international law. It's dealing in private international law, and we're dealing with the law of the sea, the law of the waters. And if you think about it, everything is a vessel in the sea of space. So the most appropriate law for us to really use is to use the law of the waters, which is where the laws of commerce are really established when we're dealing with boats going out to sea. And there's this idea that they may be lost because of all the perils of the sea and you're dealing with multiple jurisdictions because we're moving goods from one country to another now, all the laws a lot of laws of commerce are established there and if we think about the woman is also a vessel you know and so so we like to say that you know when a ship sets sail we say it makes birth and it's it's kind of funny because we all we have this thing called the birth certificate which represents the birth of this body, but really it's actually representation of the birth of the person. And so we have this idea of making birth, we have an idea that the paper is a vessel, and what's the cargo on the vessel? Paper's made of wood, right? 
What's the cargo on the vessel? It's made of plants, I guess, for a lot of it, cotton and stuff. But what's on the what's the cargo on the vessel? The symbols. Which are made with what? Ink. Which is minerals. Right? Minerals are raw materials. And so is the paper. The paper is timber to be cut for the making of a contract. So you have this idea of 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 the vessel holding its cargo and making sure that cargo sees its way safely across the seas of space to to uh, the receiver, to the intended receiver. So anytime you're mailing something, you're dealing with kind of sending out ships. And so as one of the things that really interested me, interested me in the uh, commercial game is once I saw there was an idea of admiralty and that I could invoke admiralty, I could invoke the laws of, of the sea. All of a sudden, I got like this five-year-old pirate mindset, and I'm thinking of Pirates of the Caribbean. I'm thinking about, you know, vessels and sails. How does a vessel travel? By means of sails. Well, sails can be spelled S-A-I-L or S-A-L-E, and so there we go. We're and also, um, okay, I can go in this one little piece of color that I kind of always do. For those of you who haven't heard, you'll really like it, I think. When you get anything that comes your way, it's an offer, okay? And an offer in the UCC is to be construed as inviting acceptance. Usually if you ask or offer something to somebody, it kind of means that you're inviting them to accept. So when you get a summons to court, it's an offer, and it's, which means it's an invitation. So you are you are have an invitation, but in court you have these the flags up there, which means we're dealing with admiralty because the flag is a hieroglyphic that represents jurisdiction and... And uh, so therefore, everything is considered a vessel in court. And so there's a bunch of birth being had. There's a lot of birth being made. So we just got an invitation to a birth, but it's actually multiple births. And it's on a specific day. So we got an invitation on a specific day to a day of the birth, okay? The birth, or the birthday. And uh, usually we have to bring our, our presence which our presence is our P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, but it's also our P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, which is our value that we're going to bring. We're invited to participate. And, and again, it's so funny that at birthday, we like to have parties, which we already established in court. There are parties, and we're, our objective of court is to join the parties. So in all, when we get a summons to court, we're invited to a birthday to the parties. We have tea. We bring our presence, and we can even exchange our presence with one another in camera, which another uh, a definition of the term camera is in chambers or in private with just the judge and it's out of the view of the people. So if you'd like, you could exchange your presence in camera. You can exchange.